Oh, hello there. Uh, hi, I'm Justin Black. Uh, this video is the first in a series on learning to see, and I'm calling it the visionary wilderness, which you can think of as a gap between the way that humans see and the way that cameras see, and how we can fill that gap by applying passion, experience, point of view, uh, visualization of images in our mind's eye to create uh, original creative images that share our personal experience of the world. Uh, to me, that act of sharing personal vision with another human being is what makes photography and uh, art in general worthwhile. There's a little bit of a backstory to the title, The Visionary Wilderness. It originates with my old friend, mentor, and employer, Galen Rowell, who had been planning on using the title uh, on a book uh, that was to be about the intersection of uh, cognitive science about the human visual system and how that can be applied to photography. Um, Galen's inspiring photographs of the Earth's high and wild places, uh, adventurers, adventurers moving through it, <clears throat> had uh, certainly played a large part in my own enthusiasm for photography as a young teenager. Um, so you can imagine when in 1999, at the age of 25 years old, I was offered a job uh, managing his image collection and serving as an instructor in his photo workshops program. I had the privilege of working with Galen at Mountain Light Photography for the last three years of his life and served as manager and gallery curator of Mountain Light Photography for seven years after that. You might be familiar with Galen's work uh, captured in classic books like Mountain Light, In Search of the Dynamic Landscape, which is an absolute classic and I highly recommend it. Uh, Galen Rowell's Vision, um, which was compiled together from his Outdoor Photographer articles, uh, just a phenomenal book from the early 1990s. And then its later companion, uh, Galen Rowell's Inner Game of Outdoor Photography, which is the same kind of format, uh, but published, gosh, in 1999 or 2000. Uh, and then Galen Rowell, A Retrospective, which uh, I had a hand in editing and wrote a couple essays for it as well, and did all the color pre-press work on it. Um, and I'm really immensely proud of this one. Uh, I think it's just a, it's a really cool book that brings together essays by a bunch of people who knew Galen in the various um, sort of worlds that he ran in, uh, from climbing and mountaineering to conservation to fine art photography and all sorts of things. But my personal favorite, if you can find a copy, is one of his early books called In the Throne Room of the Mountain Gods about the 1975 uh, American K-2 expedition, which was actually an abject failure, but the, uh, the story that Galen tells about it is immensely honest. Just a great book. Not so much about photography, a great mountaineering book. Um, if you're interested in photography, the others are probably the way to go. Galen was the archetypal adventurer, landscape and travel photographer, mountaineering photographer. Um, you know, he had an incredibly productive career doing numerous assignments for National Geographic and other prestigious publications. He was an amazing writer, uh, a really effective conservationist, um, a really wonderful teacher and, uh, you know, generous mentor to me. Um, he was a true inspiration and I really miss him. Um, back in August of 2002, August 11th specifically, um, at about 1.23, or actually precisely 1.23 in the morning, uh, he and his wife Barbara were passengers on board a chartered twin-engine turboprop flying back from Oakland, California to where they lived in, in the eastern Sierra Nevada in Bishop, California, after returning from a uh, expedition in the Bering Sea. And uh, anyway, their, their plane crashed on final approach um, and they were killed instantly along with the pilot and the pilot's girlfriend. Um, it was a tragedy and it, it uh, you know, I lost uh, two good friends and uh, you know, the world lost uh, a creative force the likes of which I've never seen before or since. Beyond that, I'm really disappointed that Galen never got a chance to finish the Visionary Wilderness book. Having seen him present a lecture of the same name in his advanced workshops and having read early drafts of chapters that were intended for the book, um, I'm sure that it would have been his greatest contribution to photo photographic literature. Um, so what I propose is that we draw inspiration from Galen's curiosity and desire to understand better the way that we see and how that understanding can be applied to advancing the quality and meaning of creative photography. You know, the human visual system is just incredible and it's really easy to take for granted. Um, 
It has the ability to use light to instantaneously process an array of incomplete information and develop a, a useful model of the world out of it. Um, and much of this information is processed subconsciously. We're not even aware it's going on. We're making judgments based on it. Um, and the visual system is making a lot of practical assumptions about the world we live in. It's, it's more survival oriented than accuracy oriented. Um, you know, for example, when you're walking down the street, down a sidewalk, and the shadow of a lamppost crosses in front of your path, um, there's little chance that you'd actively consider whether or not that's a you know, solid object that you need to avoid or jump over or walk around. Um, in a photograph, though, that line becomes incredibly important. It could be the dominant graphic feature in the image that can make or break the composition. Um, and, you know, and yet we do shift our movements subconsciously often around real obstacles and objects uh, that are out there in the world. So our, our visual system is taking in this information and it's making a judgment without us actively being aware of it about things we need to pay attention to in the world and things that we can sort of disregard in the world and not consider. It also creates for us the perception of about 10 million distinct uh, colors defined by hue, luminance, and saturation. And the dynamic range of our visual system, depending on how you calculate it, is between 16 and 20 stops um, beyond even the best digital cameras. But whereas a, a camera is a sort of a mechanically precise image capture tool, the human visual system um, is a very subjective modeling tool that's relativistic. And it, uh, it just makes a model of what, we are, what we're looking at. And uh, some of the same characteristics that make it so useful also make it easily fooled. And one thing that's fooling us all the time is color. Color is not an inherent property of an object. The fact is that it's a product of the mind. It's a trick our brain uses to distinguish between different wavelengths of light, but the color we see is a combination of the wavelengths of light illuminating a thing, the way in which that thing reflects, absorbs, or transmits different wavelengths of light, and the relationship of that light reaching our eyes relative to other colors and brightness values within our visual field at the same time. Without a mind to create the sensation of color, there is no color. We can think of our experience of color in terms of local color and perceptual color. Local color is basically what we see under neutral light. That is, light comprising a balanced representation of the entire visible spectrum. This is the sort of lighting that we use to establish our impression that an object has a particular color, like an orange orange or a red rose. In the real world, however, the colors we experience are not fixed. What we see is perceptual color or relativistic color. In other words, our mental impression of a color or tone is determined by a combination of the local color of the object, the wavelength of the light illuminating it, and the colors and brightness values that surround it within the field of view. This enables our brain to create the impression of color constancy, giving us the illusion that the color of an object remains the same in changing illumination. But the reality is that the wavelength of light reflected toward your eyes off, say, an orange illuminated by blue skylight will be much different than the wavelength reflected from an orange in warm sunset light. In either case, we still see an orange orange. But the camera doesn't. By fixing the color relationships at the moment of exposure, color constancy goes out the window. This is a key difference between human seeing and photographic seeing. In order to create illusions of naturalistic color, painters have long understood the difference between local color and perceptual color. There's a wonderful scene in the film, The Girl with the Pearl Earring, in which Colin Firth's Jan Vermeer asks uh, Scarlett Johansson's Greet to look out the window and tell him what color the clouds are. At first, she says white, but then she pauses and she says, no, yellow, blue, gray. In a nutshell, that's the difference between local and perceived color. The impressionist Claude Monet studied color extensively, as seen in this series of the facade of Rouen Cathedral at different times of day and qualities of light. And the American painter Sanford Robinson Gifford made this painting, A Winter Twilight, in 1862, previewing the effect of the graduated neutral density filter in photography by painting his treetops in dark silhouette against the bright post-sunset sky while painting his foreground in more open and detailed shade light, though the light illuminating the trees in the foreground are really the same. But this is how our eyes expect to see a scene like this. Silhouette against bright tones, and then in broader areas of shadow, lighter tones and greater detail. 
One of the limitations or features, if you want to think of it that way, of color slide film was its fixed color response. In this scene of Eagle Falls at Lake Tahoe, daylight balance slide film renders the warm colors even warmer than when I saw them, and the cooler, bluer colors are even cooler than when I was standing there. Back then, many of a shooting slide film in natural light used to carry colored filters to compensate for color casts, particularly in the shade. But that also meant that we had to train our visual systems to tune into what color the light was relative to the neutral daylight balance of the film. The trick was to identify the color of the light source. In scenes illuminated solely by scattered blue skylight, for instance, you might have to use a fairly strong amber filter to keep the scene from going uniformly blue. In the case of this image of aspens in Bishop Creek Canyon in the eastern Sierra Nevada, I waited for the sunlight to come over the rim of the canyon to illuminate the yellow foliage out of the frame over my shoulder, creating a warm light source for the trunks in the foreground. Notice how the trees behind are still primarily lit by skylight and are blue as a result. If I'd shot all the trees in the same cool light and used a warming filter to cancel out the blue, the scene would lack that lovely color contrast. In today's digital cameras, the auto white balance feature can now do the color compensation for us, but it's worth considering whether the camera might be overdoing it and canceling out color that you would rather have in your composition. Tuning into the subtleties of color of light is still critical for effective color photography. And then of course, in dim light, our perception of color falls apart as the cone-shaped light receptors that our eyes use to perceive different wavelengths of light don't work well at all, and we fall back on the much more sensitive rods which sense relative brightness, but not color. If you've ever wondered about the difference between how the aurora borealis looks with your own eyes versus the much more intense light show revealed in a photograph, the limited capability of your cones is to blame. So let's have a look at some optical illusions and demonstrations that might help us understand a little better um, the kinds of things that are going on in our, in our head as, as we make judgments about what we're seeing in the world. First of all, here are two versions of the same landscape. This is from one of our expeditions to Torres del Paine National Park in Patagonia. Uh, it's the same image, just processed differently. One is processed to be light, one is processed to be dark, and each one has four uh, circles in it. And most people looking at these side by side would say that the circles on the left are darker than the circles on the right. Um, when in fact you may have guessed they're actually the same. This famous checker, uh, checker shadow experiment, uh, which you may have seen before by Edward Adelson, um, basically you have a computer generated design of a checkerboard with a cylinder casting a shadow across it, and we have uh, squares A and B, and uh, you know it's very clear that on the checkerboard, square A is a dark square and square B is a light square, uh, but in fact, they're exactly the same color of gray. Um, and of course, there is no change in the light falling on the subject matter. It's a computer generated image um, that's just radiating from our monitor. But our brains are used to looking at a situation like this, making the judgment that square B is in shade and square A is in bright direct sunlight or bright direct light. And so therefore, we infer that, that uh, square B must be lighter square than square A, when in fact they're the same. This also carries through when working with color. Uh, another version of the Adelson experiment, which I've uh, added to here, uh, shows an oval of yellow on the dark square, square A, and on square B. And you'll see that the yellow looks darker uh, on square A and lighter on square B. In fact, of course, it's the same hue of yellow. Here's another example of the difference between local color and perceived color. Um, this is called the Rubik's Cube test. And uh, if you notice, it's a, basically a Rubik's Cube with uh, different colors scattered across the surface, one in yellow light, one in blue light. And, uh, you know, on the yellow light, you can see the, the blue of the blue squares, just like you can in the blue, uh, blue light. And uh, you can see the yellow squares, green, red, etc. The difference is that um, if you look at the circle down there, it's demonstrating that the blues you see in the, in the illuminated portion, or what, what appears to be the, the illuminated portion of the Rubik's Cube in the yellow side, are identical to the yellow squares in the blue illuminated portion um, 
on the right side. Um, they're both gray. When you're working out there in the field in changing light, we work with all different kinds of light, you know, direct sunlight midday, direct sunlight uh, at the edges of the day, sunrise and sunset, um, diffuse skylight, diffuse uh, light coming through clouds. All these things influence the way we perceive color and tone. And, um, you know, if you, if you tune into those things, you can use them to your advantage. Uh, but if you're just sort of taking for granted that you're seeing the world as it is, then it's going to re really re be reflected in your photographs. Right. In terms of color constancy, which I spoke of earlier, this is a great example by a Japanese psychologist named Akiyoshi Kitaoka, um, where he photographed a plate of uh, strawberries under very, very cyan filtered light. And, uh, you know, you look at this and you know, the red looks subdued because of the, uh, the cyan lighting, which as uh, red's opposite on the color wheel, it, you know, the cyan reduces the amount of light, red light. Um, but the secret to this image, the trick in this image, is that in fact there's not a single red pixel here at all. Um, the, what appears as red in this image is actually just gray, pure neutral gray. And here's another one just for fun, the Kofka ring effect, which, uh, you know, when the, the two square or two, two halves are merged, um, it's pretty clear that the, uh, that the ring is the same tone. Uh, but when they're split just a little bit, suddenly the right hand tone against the right hand ring against the lighter background immediately looks darker than the left hand ring against the dark background. It's, a, it's still the same tone of gray, that nothing's changed. And this is particularly pronounced when they're offset. Uh, in, in example C here. So anyway, I think it's really important to just be aware that our visual system is capable of fooling us in these ways. And uh, you know, really, when we're looking out in the world, think in terms of how that image is gonna be recorded in the camera versus how you may be perceiving it out there in the world. Here's a picture of an extreme example between the way that our eyes see and the way that a digital camera sees. And it's actually the picture that uh, made me realize that after being a film diehard for years and years, uh, that uh, digital cameras really did have some potential. Um, it's a picture from Bryce Canyon. I was out there to teach a photo workshop, and um, this is back in 2008, I believe. And uh, I went out to scout locations early in the morning and actually went out maybe too early. So I got out there to the rim of the canyon and it is still nighttime. There's just the very faintest glimmer of, of morning light on the horizon. Um, and I'm standing there looking down into the hoodoos of Bryce Canyon and all I can really see is that there's some vague shapes that are maybe slightly less black than everything else that's black around them. Um, and I've got this Nikon D3 that Nikon's loaned me. And I think, well, what the heck? So I put it on the camera, on the, put the camera on a tripod and uh, set it to, I think, ISO 3200 for a 30 second exposure at f5.6, pointed the camera down and focused to infinity and just let it rip to see what would happen. And uh, the amazing result um, was a fully illuminated uh, landscape seeing you still had light coming from the horizon into the hillside at Bryce Canyon, kicking back reflected light into the hoodoos. Um, it just looked like a sunrise shot. And uh, you know, it was just proof that if you've got directional light and, it's, and you can allow it to accumulate over time and build up, you'll get the same kind of color that you would you know, half an hour later when the, when the sun is really on the horizon. Um, this image has actually been run double page spread in a book. It's beautiful. Um, and it was really enlightening for me. You know, modern color management enables us to do things like work up an image on a calibrated monitor, send that image to a color profiled printer, and get a highly predictable uh, result. Whereas before, you might have to do several rounds of proof printing, make some minor adjustments, go back and forth. The same holds true for working with um, you know, big offset presses, printing books or magazines and that sort of thing. Uh, it, now, uh, these days, a photographer with a well-color-managed system can 
uh, prep a file, send it electronically to a printer in Asia, and get back predictable results. Um, but this only works if we're working in a calibrated system and we understand you know, how our, our visual system um, sort of tweaks colors and, and tonal response. Um, so I, I just wanted to show you a picture of color space. So this is a picture of what's called C, CIE lab color space, uh, that sort of round area that's full of color in this image is that color space which represents all of the colors that are visible to the human eye. And that's defined by hue, which is basically what color is the color. Uh, luminance, which is brightness of the color. Is it light color or dark color? So if you take a given hue and make it lighter or darker, that's that axis of the, of the color space. And then also saturation, which is basically how pure is that color. So it's, uh, you know, if you imagine that white reflects all colors of the, of the visible spectrum. Um, if you have a particular hue and you add white to it, um, you're reducing the purity of that color because you're, you're scattering uh, light, uh, other, other wavelengths of light along with that primary color. So when you, when you pull the saturation slider in your processing software, you, you know, we usually think of it as making the color richer, but what you're really doing is making a given color more pure by sort of constraining or compressing the, the wavelengths of light that are a component of that color. Um, and also in this diagram, we see other color spaces. So you've got sRGB, which is the color space for the web, for online display, for instance, which is a relatively small um, portion of the visible spectrum. And then you have Adobe RGB 1998, which is a somewhat larger uh, expanded color gamut, uh, color space. And then Profoto RGB, which in some ways is even, uh, even goes beyond the human visual, uh, visible spectrum, um, but it's also somewhat constrained in the sort of the cyan range relative to the human visual spectrum. Um, anyway, all very interesting the things to think about and consider, just keep in mind, um, especially when you get to the processing end of things. And with regard to that, um, if you're going to get serious about doing things with your pictures, like making prints, uh, publishing books, uh, submitting images to clients like magazines or, or that sort of thing, uh, it's really important to understand good color management. And one critical aspect of that is um, having a good color managed uh, monitor, basically a profiled monitor. Um, the one that I love that I recommend um, would be, well, uh, the series anyway, would be the NEC Multisync series. Uh, the PA271Q, I think, is the current 27-inch model. Uh, I have a prior generation of the same thing. Um, with the SpectraView 2 color calibration, um, it's a, basically a color meter that, that reads uh, grayscales and color scales off the monitor and then gives you a, a profile for the monitor so that you can have consistent color from session to session when you're editing. And you can... Uh, import profiles for printers and presses and all that sort of thing and preview how the colors might shift in different color spaces working with different uh, output devices. Um, if you're serious about color work uh, or any kind of photography work in digital uh, media, it's absolutely critical. Um, you can sort of fudge it uh, calibrating laptops, um, often don't work so well. Um, but you can get closer by, by manually calibrating, like on the Mac you can manually calibrate the monitor and that at least gives you something of a, of a level playing field, sort of a more even starting point when you're working so that you know what to anticipate, what to expect when you're looking at your computer and, and editing images. Uh, but color management, if you really want to make the most of digital photography, it's absolutely critical. So thank you for joining me. I appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and turn on your notifications so that you're notified every time we post a new video. And join us next time when we're talking about aspects of photographic vision. Thank you very much and take care.